right, so I hope everyone can see me well and I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, a, a small thumbs up in the chat would be nice if you can hear me well, because this is also the first time that I'm using this. Perfect. Okay, right. So, uh, well, yeah, then let's get this started, I guess. So first of all, uh, it's a huge honor to be here. I really want to thank everyone. Um, this is the first keynote I'm ever giving in my life so far. So I'm very excited. I hope it doesn't show too, uh, too, too much. Um, yeah, so first of all, who am I in the first place? You already out my name. Uh, it's Gina Heuske. I'm a 37 year old uh, full time nerd, so to speak, um, software engineer by trade and by heart, uh, maker, hobby baker. And I have to add that the hobby baker thing is not a thing that started with the pandemic, but is something that I actually did before as well. And I'm also the creator and maintainer of Octoprint. And um, I would now, before I continue to talk about that, one, I, I would like to know who of you has heard or used Octoprint, um, has heard uh, or used about Octoprint so far. So I'm going to give this some quick time, but yeah, it looks like the majority has not heard or used it so far, heard about or used it so far. Well, English in the morning is tricky. Okay, so um, yeah, well, um, then let's maybe explain first what Octoprint is in the first place so that you know from what uh, direction I'm talking here today. Uh, Octoprint is a web interface for consumer 3D printers, uh, those things that uh, these days you actually can buy in the hardware stores. Um, it's an open source project uh, licensed under the AGPL v3. Uh, currently, it has something around 100,000 confirmed users worldwide. I don't know an actual number because uh, the usage tracking that I do is obviously opt in due to privacy reasons. So uh, I don't know about you if you're using it or not, unless you uh, tell me about it. Uh, it's written in uh, Python for the back end and HTML and CSS and JavaScript for the front end. And you can find all about it on octoprint.org. And I wrote this thing uh, out of uh, yeah an old an own personal uh, itch to scratch because back in 2012 I got myself my first own 3D printer and found myself in the situation that it was now taking up space in my office and producing fumes and noises and all that and that was not yeah that great to sit next to while hacking on stuff so I uh, yeah wanted a way to control it remotely and this is when I sat down over my Christmas break and started working on Octoprint. We are now looking at almost eight years of history of this project and um, the popularity was actually big enough that uh, back in uh, 2014, so six years ago already, I was able to go full time with Octoprint. Uh, back then I got hired by a company, a 3D printer company who uh, yeah, employed me to work full time on moving Octoprint forward. Then in April 2016, I had to switch to crowdfunding because they ran out of money. And um, yeah, so it has been a, a wild ride, so to speak, and it has been quite the adventure. Uh, over the course of uh, all these eight years, you see there have been a lot of releases, which are these little uh, yeah, green markers there. Uh, there have has been a lot of improvement around Octo, uh, around the, the, the um, yeah, the, the infrastructure and all that. And um, yeah, so it's it has been really an exciting time. And I learned a lot about uh, things in the meantime. And um, uh, yeah, I want to talk to today a bit about, um, yeah, about the experiences that I had or rather the, the lessons that I took from them. So what it is like, what it is like to run an, an open source project for eight years uh, of your life. Um, six of those full time and um, also how it is to run an, uh, an end user facing piece of software for so long because yeah, Octoprint is actually more uh, targeting your, your run of the mill 3D printer user and those are not necessarily developers. And I'll also talk about that a bit later and what that means for uh, what, what indications that has. So, um, yeah, and, and I'm going to talk about um, the good, the bad, and the ugly that I experienced. So uh, let's dive right in, I guess, and start with the good. Um, 
So obviously, when you're working on your own software project this long, on your own open source project for this long, it is your project. What does this mean? Well, it means you can shape it. It's it's your vision that you implement. You do not have to trust anyone else to make decisions for you. You do not have to give away control and all that. And you do not have to face what I would like to call politics-driven architecture, uh, which is something that I experienced within my former life as a corporate software engineer, where uh, technical and architecture decisions are, are made based on internal department politics sometimes and not on what is the best choice for this particular uh, problem that we are facing here. And also very important, obviously, is you work on something that you'd, uh, you you work on something that you actually use yourself and that you enjoy using yourself. And I have right next to me here, I have like two printers that are uh, yet that would be up and running if I was not giving this talk right now. I also have a laser cutter back there that runs the Octoprint as well. And yeah, so I use my own software daily uh, or more or less daily. And this is a really, really great feeling. And uh, this is something that makes working on an open source project, even for that long, uh, very, very enjoyable. Another thing that makes it very, very enjoyable is the fact that you help people. So this is also something that I really, really enjoy and that I've come to cherish as, 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 a, re as a really important part of my day-to-day -day life um, is um, people have problems and you, 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 you help them, you have them help them solve their problems, you enable them to overcome their problems by providing them with a solution. And sometimes they even say thank you. Uh, you I, I get the occasional email here and there or just a tweet in the morning or something like that, that just says thank you. And that, that makes, yeah, all of the bad and ugly we will be talking about later, uh, so much worth it. Um, I, I have gotten a lot of feedback over the years and, and, and one of the most funny ones that I ever got was a, 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 a guy who messaged me and told me that I saved his marriage because um, he was spending so much time with his printer in his garage all the time because he had to babysit it basically and the wife and the kids were not amused and then he installed Octoprint and then he could get back uh, into spending time with them and just sneakily keeping an eye on his print uh, while while doing that. So yay, <laughs> that's not something you hear every uh, every day and uh, especially not in, in, in non-open source work, I think. Right, and um, another thing that is very, very dear to my heart and a, a huge advantage of working on an open source project for this long, or even just working on open source in general, is you learn tons of new stuff. So I'm not just talking about software development itself. Obviously, my coding skills have increased ever since I started working on Octoprint. I constantly learn new libraries. I constantly learn new tricks up my sleeve. Uh, I learn more Python. I get more, uh, more proficient in this stuff. Uh, but uh, when you run a project like this, you also need to learn about project management. Uh, you need to learn about community management and how to manage your community's expectations, how to give them a forum, a platform to exchange things, exchange ideas, exchange uh, solutions, help each other, stuff like this. You have to learn about release management. So uh, it's not just that you throw code in a Git repository and people then pull it in and everything is fine and dandy and works, but at some point you will realize at some yeah, at some, after some growth of your project, you really need to put out stable, reliable builds that you can reproduce and stuff like this. So yeah, that is, uh, that is all that comes with uh, running such an open source project. And uh, talking about release management, you also learn the value of release candidates when you suddenly find yourself in a, on a Saturday morning trying to frantically uh, fix a bug in the stable release you pushed out on Friday. Um, and you also learn how how bloody tricky it can be to get people to actually run release candidates, which comes back to community management, where you need to try to incentivize people to help you run the project because you can't do everything on your own. And yeah, in case of Octoprint, there was also a bit of brand development involved. So I need a funny, a funny little logo. I need some corporate identity and all that so that things get re recognizable. So yeah, you learn not only about software development when you run such a uh, such a project, and I have to say that I really enjoy that. 
Um, if you like learning, running an open source project is like a full, full overdose <laughs> of learning. But as I already hinted at, um, yeah, it's not all fine and dandy, sadly. Um, there are also some bad things that uh, you will have to face when doing this. Um, one obvious big point, uh, probably for most of you, is uh, the work-life balance situation, uh, especially if you run a project like Octoprint or even something smaller um, as a side project next to your own full-time job, it can become a bit much. It can become really hard to shut off and recharge. Um, and you really need to learn to be very protective of your private time. For example, with Octoprint, uh, you saw on the on the on the on the timeline, um, the first two years almost I did it next to my own full time job. So after 40 hours per week of regular work, I then had to uh, I then also tried to shoulder everything that I had to do with Octoprint during my after hours, so right after work, on the weekends, during vacation. And not only was that something that friends and family did not find particularly funny after a while, but I also noticed it. So I noticed an, an, a negative impact on my health and on my motivation as well. And so this is something that you need to always keep an eye out in my personal experience because no one else will. And um, yeah, you need to take breaks. You need to make sure that you do not spend all your time, uh, all your waking time in front of a PC and code away on your on your pet project or on your full time project. Um, it it will break you long term. So if you can do that for a while, but you should have a plan B in order to get away from this mode. Um, and uh, another bad thing, sadly, is pay. No one likes to talk about money, but we like having it in order to be able to pay our bills. And um, yeah, asking for donations on an open source project is is still a bit tough. You it always feels a bit weird. So here is something for free, but also please give me money. Don't ask me what that was, what what kind of discussion that was with my tax consultant. Um, and it also usually doesn't scale. So usually what you get. Um, when you ask for donations on an open source project, it will not be enough to pay the rent. Uh, it's it's more like beer money, uh, as some people would call it. And um, thankfully, uh, I found that um, yeah, with Octoprint, I, I faced the situation back in 2016 that I had to go donation based and and, and crowd funded full time. And um, I realized that if you really make it transparent how much work an open source project can be and how much work you're actually putting in, how much of yourself you're pouring in, so to speak, and if you have a, a somewhat stable uh, user base, then it can actually work. And in my case, so far, it is working. Um, and it's definitely working better target targeting. I, I feel a bit bad using this work, but uh, targeting end users rather than uh, companies in my experience, weirdly, because uh, yeah, companies always have this capitalistic approach of uh, what do I get back in return? And the software that you're using gets maintained for the foreseeable future apparently doesn't seem to suffice for them as a, as a reason to give you money. But yeah, um, so in order to be able to make this a viable approach financially as well to work on an open source project from my personal experience, and I do not say that this is a general uh, advice that is applicable to every single, single project out there, but it worked for Octoprint and its target audience, is uh, you really should make it easy for people to give you tiny but recurring tips. So do not ask for a please give me a one time payment of 20 or 50 or 100 or something, but rather make it possible for them to give you one dollar per month or something like this. Because if you get 2,000 or 3,000 people doing that, it quickly adds up. And um, in order to do that, you should also offer them uh, yeah, there various ways to do so. So we have these days, we have GitHub sponsors. There's Patreon, which is still what, what Octoprint primar primarily gets funded with. There's Libera Pay. There is um, DonorBox. There is PayPal, obviously, for one-time one payments. At least in Germany, you only can do one-time pay payments unless you have a business account. For more. let's not dive into these uh, details, but still, um, yeah, it's a bit. You you should give them choice uh, because if 
people do not like Patreon and you only allow Patreon, then yeah, well, then you won't get this donation. So yeah, that has been my experience in that regard. And uh, the final bad thing, solitude. Um, especially at the start of your project, you will be doing it alone. And in the case of Octoprint, funnily enough, I still mostly do it alone. And the thing is that people are really fast to request features, but slow to contribute them. So um, it's easy to say, hey, it would be great if uh, Octoprint also did this and that, but actually making it do that and not only making it do that once, but then uh, keeping that functionality maintained through the years, that is hard or at least it is trickier or, or more work than just saying, hey, it would be nice. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, the, the thing is, um, from my personal experience is you should make it easy for people to help you, but without having to then maintain whatever they edit. So something like a plugin system can go a long, long way here. All right, and now while we are talking about the bad things, let's go to the ugly things. And uh, yeah, there are sadly some um, entitlement at attacks. Uh, this is something that I fear a lot of you have seen in the open source space. Uh, you have users that want something immediately done and who treat you a bit like your that like their personal slave or something like this. People shaming you for pushing a release because it contained a bug. Uh, and yes, these are all things that I've actually heard. Um, people who outright insult you. And I do not want to talk, do not want to collect examples of all of this here. But uh, yeah, um, in, the problem is people like this can really ruin your day as an open source developer. And the important thing to, to remember here at all times is really, yes, those are vocal. Uh, and they can ruin your day, but the, the 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 silent majority who is happy with using what you put out and who is grateful for what for the work you do is there. And they may be silent, but they are definitely the majority. And this is just something that you have to keep in mind. And what you also have to keep in mind is, in my opinion, a lot of people will tell you, well. Uh, this is just, yeah, this is just like it is in open source and you just have to grow a thick skin as a maintainer. And I do not agree with this, I have to say. I think we should just, as maintainers, we should say, no, nope, this is a boundary that I'm not allowing you to cross. And, um, and um, the other thing that you might face is license violations. Some companies stealing your code and... Um, uh, and or you you just thinking that maybe some company stole your code, and um, yeah, this is something that feels really really bad. I have not had definitely happened that I have not definitely sorry my English is just confused right now. <laughs> I haven't definitely had that happen with Octoprint so far, but I've had some cases where I suspected that someone was using my software internally in their product without actually uh, adhering to the license. And the, the thing is, I could have tried to, to figure that out. I could have tried to track them into a legal battle over this, got myself a lawyer, pay the lawyer with the limited amount of funds that I get and all that, and try to publicly shame them, something like this. But if it's just a sneaky suspicion from my experience, I'm not sure if, it, if it's always worth that. So what I'm trying to say here is choose your battles wisely. License violations suck. License violations are something that are really fully against the nature of open source. But on the other hand, if you're a maintainer, if you're a loan maintainer, especially, then you cannot fight all the battles out there. So if you have the possibility to outsource this to something like gplviolations.org or something, I don't know, then maybe do that, but try not to get worked up too much about this as well from my personal experience, usually it's simply not worth it because your product is still the popular one. And yeah, so. And the final ugly side of things and uh, something that I guess all of you have also faced uh, one time or another during your life is the risk of burnout. So 
we've seen there is a lot of stuff that you constantly have to learn. There's uh, quite a number of things that you have to worry about, payment, uh, work-life balance, and all of that. And on top of this, there are also the ugly sides of things, uh, entitled users, personal attacks, insults that you have to face, uh, GPL violations <laughs> and uh, stuff like this. And that, yeah, that can really, really weigh down on you. Um, so burnout for open source maintainers is a real threat. And uh, I would be lying if I said I have not faced it in the past. And what I would really recommend here is if you do regular open source work or just if you work in general, but especially if you do regular open source work, uh, really keep a close eye on your own mental health and your own physical health. Um, learn to spot warning signs of burning out, like increased apathy or irritability. In general, not feeling all there or feeling like mm -hmm, everything sucks and all that, because yeah, this is a um, this can spiral out of control quickly, and you do not want that. You do not want to burn out on your open source project because, as we saw, it is a work of passion. It is something where you help people. It is something where you learn so much. So it would be a real pity if, due to other factors, you burn out on it and cannot do it anymore. And for that, it is really important to know that um, you do not own anyone anything when you work on open source. You give away your work for free. Uh, you're helping people for free. Um, and this is already what they are getting from you. They cannot demand from you to never take vacation days or never have a weekend or something like that. So you should not either. Um, you need to take care of yourself because no one else will. So uh, what is really, really important here is you need to le learn to say no as an open source maintainer. No to this feature, no to this bug report, and also no to this discussion yet again about a topic that you've talked about endlessly or just something that is currently not something that you have enough spoons to to tackle. And yeah, this, these are the ugly sides. The question, of course, is with all of that, that negativity <laughs> that we just talked about, would I do it again? Would I go all this? Uh, would I do all this journey? Would I go on this adventure again? And the answer is, a, is an absolutely resounding yes. Um, it is uh, a very, very wild, wild ride. I have learned so much. I have so many good memories thanks to working on Octoprint, and I'm still making new ones. Um, it is, yeah, it is something that is very humbling, but in the, at the same time also uh, something that allows you for so much personal growth and also professional growth. And it is, it is really rewarding as well, especially when you get these tiny mails or tweets here and there that say thank you. And so I would absolutely do all of this again. I would probably change some things here and there because I learned a lot, which I would put to good use, but I would totally do it again. And with that, I just want to thank you for your attention. <clears throat> I hope it was interesting. If you have any questions that we'll not be able to cover here anymore, uh, you can reach me on Twitter via at Fusel. Um, I will also put the slides up on octoprint.org slash slides later on. And with that, I just want to say thank you. <laughs>